This is a bit of part two of my John the Baptist house video and I just wanted to talk about the Catholic Church that is known as St. John the Baptist Catholic Church there on the site where they had excavated in Ein Karem and that's where Elizabeth and Zacharias lived and that's where Mary came and sang the song of the Magnificent. And Ein Karem is located about 4.5 miles west of Jerusalem. Therefore, it was within easy walking distance to and from Jerusalem. Ein Karem means spring of the vineyard and has both Jewish and Christian history. Ein Karem is still a tranquil place of trees and vineyards. That's kind of amazing, don't you think? That all of these centuries, it's still a vineyard. In the Old Testament, Ein Karem is referred to as Bet A Karem or Beth Hasarem, as found in Jeremiah 6 1 and Nehemiah 3 14. The area was within the jurisdiction of the tribe of Judah. In the New Testament, Ein Karem is best known as the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birthplace of John the Baptist. It is considered one of the top Jerusalem tour destinations for Christian pilgrims. It says um, two main sites in Ein Karem are the Church of the Nativity of John the Baptist and the Visitation Church. It is believed that Zechariah and Elizabeth had two houses in Ein Karem. Zechariah was a priest and likely wealthy. Therefore, it is very possible he had two residences in Ein Karem. Now, you know, they say Zecharias and they say Zechariah, and I think Greek is Zecharias and Hebrew is Zechariah, just to clarify. Their usual residence was in the valley, but a cooler summer house located high on a hillside allowed them to escape the heat and humidity during warmer months. So that would be where that house was just uh, in 2015, you know, when the jackhammer went through the limestone ceiling of the ancient mikvah from 2,000 years ago, and whether they found the pottery and everything, I believe that definitely could have been their house. Um, these other places are a possibility, but the thing is, is that God usually preserves the original site, and all the tourists go to another location, just like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and uh, the Garden Tomb. And one of them is the real site. But it says that they would escape the heat and humidity during the warmer months in the hills of Judea. The summer house is believed to be where the pregnant Elizabeth remained in seclusion for five months, as found in Luke 124. It's also where Mary visited her. The house in the valley was where John the Baptist was born. It was also here that Zechariah finally regained his power of speech when he wrote on a writing tablet that the baby's name was to be John. During excavations in the church, which has at its core the cave which Christian tradition identifies as the birthplace of John the Baptist, there have been discovered remains of two Byzantine chapels which mark the place where early Christians venerated this site as the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birthplace of John the Baptist. The Byzantine ruins included two chapels, the Martyr's Chapel, where the modern church is located, and another chapel under the southern side of the monastery. The Martyr's Chapel refers to the children killed by Herod in Matthew 2.16. An inscription in a mosaic panel reads in Greek, Hail Martyrs of God, whom it refers is unknown. And two altars have also been discovered in this church. The high altar is dedicated to St. John. To the right is Elizabeth's altar, and to the left are steps leading down to a natural grotto, identified as John's birthplace, and believed to be part of his parents' home. Also found under this church are remains from the first century AD, including a flight of plastered steps 
recently identified as part of a typical Jewish ritual bath, mikvah, for purification. Some have linked the discovery to Zechariah. As a priest in the temple, he probably had to purify himself every day since his meals were often based on sacrifices brought by pilgrims. It is therefore possible that Zechariah had a mikvah in his own house. Wow, I didn't even think of that. You know, I knew that they were keeping the Halakha laws and all of that. But Zechariah being a priest offering the incense in the holy temple, it's more than likely he would have had that big mikvah in his home. And that the um, mikvah that they found down below those people's living room in Ein Karam probably is related to Zechariah and Elizabeth. That's really stunning to think about. So, therefore, the archaeological find is of major importance to substantiate the Christian tradition. In the Crusader period of 1099 to 1291, a church was built over the house believed to be the house of Zechariah, first mentioned by a Russian pilgrim, Daniel, in 1109. This church was one of the first to be built by the Crusaders. The Virgin Mary's visit to Elizabeth is depicted in a mosaic on the facade and is commemorated in a two-tiered church built on a slope of the hill south of Ein Karem. Several churches and monasteries were built during the Byzantine period. The Visitation Crusaders Church was built over one of them. Later, the Crusaders rebuilt some of the ruined Byzantine churches. The upper floor of the Visitation Church shows remains of the Crusaders Church, especially on the south wing. The modern church was completed in 1955 and designed by Antonio Barluzzi. The artistically decorated church of the Visitation is considered one of the most beautiful of all the gospel sites in the Holy Land. This church is believed to be the site of Zechariah and Elizabeth's summer home, where Mary came to visit her cousin. So their home would be in the mountains, up where those people lived, where they found the 2,000-year-old ritual bath. So it's just, I mean, just thinking about him being the high priest, he certainly would have been, you know, keeping the purification laws. On the wall opposite the church, ceramic plaques reproduce Mary's song of praise as found in Luke 1, 46-55, which I spoke in my last video. Mary's exaltation is translated into 58 languages that can be found hanging on large plaques on the side of the church. In the lower chapel, a vaulted passage leads to an old well. Ancient tradition suggests that a spring joyfully bursts out of the rock here where Mary greeted Elizabeth. A huge stone set in a niche is known as the stone of hiding. According to an ancient tradition, the stone opened to provide a hiding place for the baby John during Herod's massacre of the innocents an event depicted in a painting on the wall. That's really interesting, isn't it? And Mary Spring. In a valley to the south of the village is a freshwater spring known as Mary Spring or the Fountain of Mary. I talked about this in my book as well. That is so cool. Tradition states that Mary quenched her thirst from the spring before climbing the hill to meet Elizabeth. So, 
she would have climbed the hill probably to that location where the mikvah was. And the village of Ein Karem gets its name from the spring. Its meaning is derived from the Arabic Ein, meaning spring, and Karem, vineyard or olive grove. A small abandoned mosque is built over the spring, of course. Another reminder that this was once an invader Arab village. Southwest of Ein Karem, off Route 386, a Greek Melkite monastery and a Franciscan convent mark the desert of St. John, a site where John the Baptist is believed to have lived in seclusion. Ein Karem is home to five churches and monasteries, the Church of St. John the Baptist, the Visitation Church, Notre Dame de Zion Convent. It is operated by order of the nuns of the Zion Sisters and has been converted to function as a guest house. Greek Orthodox St. John's Convent. This serves the Greek Orthodox community of Ein Karem and the ancient church 1894 was restored in 1975. All Moscovia Russian Monastery called the Gorny Monastery initially. Construction on this five onion dome structure started in 1905 and was completed only in 2005. Later its domes were painted in gold. Additionally, a focal point is where the famous Mary's well, where it's believed that Mary, miraculously pregnant with Jesus, sat and drank from its spring waters while sitting with Elizabeth, who was miraculously pregnant with John at the time. John was the prophesied forerunner of Messiah, whose purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. In Malachi 3.1, Behold, I'm sending my messenger, and he will clear a way before me, and the Lord whom you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. Malachi 4.5-6, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers, so that I will not come and strike the land with complete destruction. I wanted to add something here. The Lord showed me something pertaining to Jesus connected to Elijah that is so stunning and shocking, and it was going to be part of the second book, which got interrupted by my mother's death and then having our home sold and gone and having to move into storage units in a hotel. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I'm going to finish that, you know. And what I have to say is earth-shattering. That's all I can say for now. It is earth-shattering. But John had a supernatural birth and calling. In Luke 1, 11 through 17, which I talked about before, now an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice over his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God, and it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous for to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It was in Ein Karem that Mary magnified the Lord and that was the song that she sang. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior.
For he has had regard for the humble state of his bondservant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is to generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has given help to his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, just as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. And John's message was the message of repentance. Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, when he said, The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locust and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, or brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance, and do not assume that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham, and the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is being cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And... Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have the need to be baptized by you, and yet you're coming to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Allow it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him, and after he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settling on him. And behold, a voice from the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Ein Karem was an important Jewish village during the late Second Temple period, during which it became important to Christianity Christian tradition holds that John the Baptist was born in Ein Karem, following the biblical verse in Luke saying John's family lived in a town in the hill country of Judea. And that's exactly where that house is that had the stairs going down to the mikveh in the living room of the home. Probably because of its location between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, this location was a very comfortable one for a pilgrimage, and this led to the establishment of many churches and monasteries in the area. I talked about the spring that provides water to the village of Ein Karem, situated um, settlement there from an early time. Pottery has been found near the spring dating to the Middle Bronze Age. During the Iron Age, or Israelite period, Ein Karem is usually identified as the location of the biblical village of Beth Ha Karem. Second Temple period, a well-preserved mikveh 
Jewish ritual bath indicates there was a Jewish settlement in the Second Temple period along with some other discoveries such as a handful of graves, bits of wall, and an olive press. A reservoir here was mentioned in the Copper Scroll, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. During excavations in the Church of St. John the Baptist, a marble statue of Venus or Aphrodite was found, broken in two. It is believed to date from the Roman era and was probably toppled in Byzantine times. Today the statue is at the Rockefeller Museum. Excavations in front of the same church, which has at its core the cave, which Christian tradition identifies as the birthplace of John the Baptist, have unearthed remains of two Byzantine chapels one containing an inscription mentioning Christian martyrs, but without any mention of John. Ceramics from the Byzantine period have also been found in Ein Karim. Sources from the Byzantine period are associating Ein Karim with the place where Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, had lived, which is not properly named by the New Testament. In around 530 AD, the Christian pilgrim Theodosius places Elizabeth's town at a distance of five miles from Jerusalem, which suits Ein Karim. Now, there was a cave that they found somewhere along the banks of the Jordan River, and inside there was drawn a man that had like a loincloth that was like a animal skin, and he had a belt. And he had, you know, his arm up in the air, and the hand was cut off. Well, that's representative of the Messiah being cut off. And nobody knows this, and the guy who excavated and did a documentary about it didn't know what it meant. So I'm letting this be known because this is what the Lord had shown me, and all of the all the things I lined out through the book they kind of add up and show you the revelation of that and when I realized it was referring to the Messiah being cut off it probably has to be John the Baptist in that depiction And I'm saying this out loud for the first time. Nobody's ever heard it or seen it or known it. It's something given by the Holy Spirit that's pretty stunning. To Mimi, the physician who died in 990, mentions a church in Ein Karim that was venerated by the Christians, also mentioning an old custom of the Jews of Ein Karim to make wreaths from the boughs of branches of a wild plant belonging to the mint family, Lamiasia, during the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. Okay, well, I wrote something about plants in my book, and I wrote about the lamb's ear plant. And it is related to the mint family. Is there a huge connection there? I mean, God just does these things, and 
this is incredible. And there was a reason why, because I believed that it was the original plant that was used during the Passover Seder. And I wrote all about the details of it, and I'm just kind of shocked at that statement. God just keeps proving things over and over that I wrote about in the book. And, you know, I'm not bragging about myself. I'm trying to praise God for what he's done. I realize how he's been involved in it, and it's like now you're just giving a huge confirmation, you know. So this is very stunning. Now what's really sad is when the Muslim invaders came in, they basically took over this village and built on top of everything that was Christian. So I'm not going to even bother with that invader history, but I will say that in 1883, the PEF survey of Western Palestine described Ain Karim as a flourishing village of about 600 inhabitants, 100 being Latin Christians. It stands on a sort of natural terrace projecting from the higher hills on the east of it, with a broad flat valley below on the west. On the south, below the village, is a fine spring, Ein City Miriam, with a vaulted place for prayer over it. The water issues from a spout to a trough. And I believe I have a picture of that in my book, actually. So, in 1896, the population of Ein Karim was estimated to be about 1,290 persons. So, 2,000 years ago, like I said, they had to have very few people in that village when Elizabeth and Zechariah lived there. Only the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible, the base for the Christian Old Testament, names a place in the hills of Judah as Karem in Joshua 15.30. Just a little bit more about the Church of the Visitation or Abbey Church of St. John in the Woods, is located across the village to the southwest from St. John's. The ancient sanctuary there was built against a rock declivity. It is venerated as the stone in which John was concealed in reference to the Proto-Evangelium of James. The site is also attributed to John the Baptist's parental summer house where Mary visited them. The modern church was built in 1955, also on top of an ancient church and its remnants. It was designed by Antonio Barluzzi, an Italian architect, who designed many other churches in the Holy Land during the 20th century. The Catholic Monastery of St. John, Baharim, St. John in the Mountains in Hebrew, is centered on a church containing the cave identified by tradition as the birthplace of John the Baptist. The church is built over the remnants of the Crusader church and its porch stands over the remains of two Byzantine chapels, both containing mosaic floors. The current structure received its outlook as the result of the latest large architectural intervention finished in 1939 under the guidance of that Italian architect. The church is mentioned in the Book of the Demonstration, attributed to Eutychus of Alexandria in the year 940, the church of Bait Zakaria in the district of Elia bears witness to the visit of Mary to her kinswoman Elizabeth. According to the Christian tradition which started in the 14th century, the Virgin Mary drank the water from this village spring, and here is also the place where Mary and Elizabeth met. Therefore, since the 14th century, the spring is known as the Fountain of the Virgin. The spring waters are considered holy by some Catholic and Orthodox Christian pilgrims who visited the site and fill their bottles. What looks like a spring is actually the end of the ancient aqueduct. So yesterday when I did the other video about John the Baptist in that um, 
ancient mikveh that's dated to the time that they lived. You know, I talked about Zechariah being in the holy temple, but I wasn't thinking about him taking a mikveh at home necessarily. So that brings it more to the forefront that it's more than likely that under those people's living room floor would be a mikvah that Zechariah and his family would have used to purify themselves. And they said that it was, um, you know, like a professional plastering job within the mikvah itself and the ancient stairs going down to it. So this, to me, is, is further proof to me that this would be the location where Zechariah would have lived. There's no doubt in my mind. And likely that gentleman in his house went down to that mikvah and stood where Zechariah and Elizabeth and probably even Mary So I'll just leave it at that for tonight, and I hope you like this subject and that it brings you a little bit of excitement when all the world's going to hell in a handbasket with all of the bank closures and everything that's happening, the destruction in California and the floods there and snow, and it's just crazy. We're being bombarded on all sides like nothing I've ever seen in my life. And sometimes it's really hard not to get disheartened when you are in the situation and you're wondering where you're going to be safe, you know. So I already had everything all prepared and stored up and all of that back at my house. But now that I don't have that, um, I wonder what's going to happen to me. And I just don't know. But I know my, my life is in the hands of God. These discoveries are very exciting. And while they might have had some ancient churches over certain spots, they certainly did not have archaeology back then. They did not do digs, and they didn't have modern equipment to do digs. So all of these ancient artifacts and everything remained buried for thousands of years. And the fact that they found this ancient 2,000-year-old mikvah under the living room floor of these people in their house says to me that there's a lot more to be discovered there. Plus they found the pottery there. So it must have been something extraordinary and of great significance to the Lord because as I was saying you know the people that owned the house they kept it quiet for I don't know how long but they said it would not let them rest and I know from a fact that when you're driven like that that is the Holy Spirit pushing you into action so that you take action to bring forth a testimony of the Lord to bring glory to his name and that's what I tried to do with my book, and that's why I talk about it so much. I'm not talking about it because it's me. I'm talking about it because I'm trying to show you the glory of God in it and how he's brought confirmations ever since that blow my mind. So I'm talking about it, getting excited, going, I talked about that. Wow, you know? <laughs> and it was guided by the Holy Spirit. So is performing magnificent things before our eyes right now and you are a witness to it so with everything collapsing all around us you know shortages of food everything and right now it's very difficult to even buy any food so we just got to hang on to our belief our faith and trust in God I don't know what's going to happen to me I have no idea Things are not looking up, and, you know, I'm just trying to deal with such a transition of life from everything happening. I just love telling stories about the Lord and bringing His glory out of it and bringing it forth. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the Lord and His glory. 
So I just want to make that clear um, because the Lord is actively putting people into action to bring forth his testimony. And I just know that this is the most valuable thing I can share right now when things are so hard and difficult everywhere you look. And, you know, my mom told me, no matter what happens, never ever lose your faith in God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Never lose your faith and never stop believing. And as things get worse, cling closer to the Lord because he's the only loyal one the only faithful one that's true and will be the best friend to you that nobody on this earth will ever be. So for now, signing out, remember to keep watching for the Lord. Soon he's going to come. Good night.